today we're going to talk about board games and designing board games as a family. So while most of us could probably put together a board game based off of what we already know about games and thinking about some of our favorite games, Julie and I are just here to give you some easy pointers and tips to help you and your family make the perfect game for you. So when we start thinking about game creation, we don't need to get locked into traditional ideas about pieces or the game board itself. So we just want you guys and we encourage you to think out of the box. So one good way to do this is to just get you and your family and just have everyone look around the house for ideas for game pieces. Mm -hmm. A game piece can be a penny. It can be something from outside, like an acorn or a pebble. You yourself could be the game piece. So just start thinking about unique ways to make the game you and your family's fun thing. Um, as far as the, you know, the board goes itself, again, think out of the box. Instead of you know, a piece of cardboard that you draw on, maybe you could find an old map that you want to incorporate into your game. Or arts and craft supplies or maybe a piece of clothing like a scarf, mm -hmm. um, or go outside and use different parts of your backyard as a board game that you can travel around with your family. So these are ways just to kind of make a unique board game. Yeah, and what's really fun too is when we start thinking about unique board games, um, this is where we can really engage our family members who love arts and crafts. Um, so that is another way to get uh, different family members engaged. Um, you really want to make sure that you design a game that appeals to your family's interests. And sometimes ideas can conflict. So when that happens, try asking the family members how we can include um, both ideas. There's nothing wrong with sharks in space. I believe it can be done. <laughs> Um, we also have examples of a board game that was designed by Stephanie's niece. So this board game was called The Carbon Cycle Reservoir Rescue. And my niece and her friend, they made it for their ninth grade biology class. Um, the game itself it requires two to five players. It lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. It has a game board, player pieces, question cards, and carbon cards. So as you can see, uh, the girls, when they designed this game, they didn't follow a traditional board game layout. This game has both an element of luck and an element of skill or expertise, which is something we're also going to talk about a little bit more later. So the order that the cards are shuffled, it brings the element of luck into this game. But you also need a solid amount of skill in this game as well. And the skill element is the expertise about the carbon cycle itself. So since this game was designed for a biology class, its intentions were to be science-based and educational. So this game fulfilled its purpose. Yeah, the trick is really trying to find the right balance for your family. Um, another consideration that we want to make is what are we trying to teach? Um, we could make the meaning of the game very clear. Um, for example, like we could make a game about helping your neighbor and you go through the board game and as you land on the board you get points because you helped your elderly neighbor save a cat from a tree or you gave somebody else a cup of sugar and that's mm -hmm. great. However, you could also try changing the game rules or the way the game plays out in order to convey the same kind of meaning. So what I would do for something like that is I would maybe tweak the theme a little bit. So instead of it being help your neighbor, it would be explore the neighborhood. And as the players, you know, go through the board and they're exploring the neighborhood, um, they're given opportunities to either help or not help other players. However, the game itself is designed so that it's more beneficial for the players to help the other players. So actually the only way you could win would be by being helpful. So this is really interesting. It's a way for us to teach kindness kind of through action instead of just theme um, or again through game mechanics. What's interesting about 
using games in this way um, is that it, it forces the players to kind of gain a greater understanding that games are a system. In order to really make the game mechanics work the way you want it to, um, you start to notice that all those little changes that are made really can dramatically affect the game. And so this is how we start to understand games as systems themselves. Um, it might also help in general, uh, have family members kind of consider what games they love are teaching. Um, they may not have looked at the things that they've been playing all their lives um, really that closely. So it's, it's helpful to also learn about what meaning games are conveying. So we would also like to remind you that making board games isn't supposed to be daunting and really hard. It's supposed to be really fun. Yeah. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, sometimes when you're starting, you may just not know what you need to do to get started to make a board game. And this is where brainstorming helps. And brainstorming is a really easy process. A simple way to brainstorm is just get everyone in your family who's going to be involved into the, in the board game around the table. Give everyone pen and paper. And for 10 minutes, just have everyone jot down ideas that they want to do for the game. And then when the 10 minutes is over, just review them. Yeah. Um, it's also important to keep in mind most games have an element of luck and an element of skill or expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's very important to keep in mind when you are creating your own game. Um, some examples of uh, games that are completely luck-based would be a game like Candyland where you are just pulling your color card and that's exactly how you move. You win Candyland by being really lucky. Mm -hmm. There's really not any skill for it. And if you have younger children in your family, that's awesome to use, you know, a more luck-based game. Um, but if it's just luck, it can be a little bit boring sometimes. So that's where you want to throw in like a skill or expertise level. An example of a game that is completely skill would be something like chess or checkers. Mm -hmm. where it's just you against your opponent, and it is just a battle of wits. But most often for families, we find that the best way to go is kind of a hybrid of luck and skill. Um, an example you may know of this would be like the game Risk. So you do need to have strategy in the game of Risk, but it, you're also still rolling that die, and it also depends on luck to see who wins or loses a battle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we're designing the game, you do, you want to consider how hard you want to make it mm -hmm. um, and how easy. Um, really, when we're designing a game, you really have to anticipate it's going to be a level of trial and error, mm -hmm. which means that somebody in the family is going to have to be appointed a record keeper. Um, it's very, very important because as you go through each step, you may think, I need to change these rules or we need to add something to the board or take something away. Um, one tool that I used was actually a dry erase board. Um, when I created my game, it was a very simple design initially. I did use a traditional kind of board setup. And, you know, so I did something kind of like that. All right. Say I wanted to make that the home base or, or something like that. And then if I went here, it means that I could roll again. Well, I found for my own game I had that as an option too many times. So maybe I decide that I take that away and I want to add another element in. Um, so really having that dry erase board is going to help you kind of make your plans. Um, I actually took pictures at each very significant change. Um, I would at least recommend using a pencil or paper before you actually sit and make the cardboard copy that you maybe want to play later on. Um, that way you, you can really actually design a game that's going to be fun for everybody. Um, another consideration is uh, you want to make sure that everybody um, is actually still engaged mm -hmm. <laughs> in the family. You know, it, it families, it, every member has a different level of attention span. So the record keeper um, really being on top of things, that can help us if we need to stop in the middle of the game. Um, 
Also keep in mind, though, as we were talking before, how games are systems. One tiny change can make the game really, really fun or really, really boring. So kind of watch the interest level of your family and the pace of the game. Um, just remember, you will be playing several versions of it before you really get to that final one. Uh, I just want to say, you know, making games, it's actually a great way to encourage unique thinking skills and to help families work together as teams. Uh, whether this is just like a brief one-time activity or it's something that you all continue to do, um, hopefully you all will have a lot of fun and find this entertaining and also find the activity to be somewhat insightful. We don't really think about it at first, but games can really teach us um, powerful concepts. Mm -hmm. They can convey meaning, um, and then they're also just great for family time. So Julia and I would love to hear about your experiences in making your own game. So please feel free to post images of your game um, or just give us some feedback on the game creation process for you and your family. Also, we would like to just hear about your favorite board games in general, because often thinking about your favorites will help you make wonderful new creations and inspire you. So we just wanted to say thank you so much thank for you. joining us and have fun game making. Mm -hmm.